My fiancé, 26-year-old male and I, 25-year-old female, have been together for a decade and have our first child. Our relationship hasn't always been rainbows and sunshine, but it was steady and solid. Or so I thought. I just gave birth to our first child last November and I'm a stay-at-home mom, which was a decision we both agreed upon. I have substantial savings since I earned a good income and started saving early on. My savings were intended to be used for our baby's necessities while his income would cover the bills. The condo and two cars are under my name. The condo and my car are paid off. It's only his car that is not. I put down half of the amount as a down payment so the monthly payments are not that high. Additionally, with my good credit, the interest rate was low. I had plans to pay off his car and transfer it to his name once I returned to work. Currently, I am on a six-month break from work due to sepsis from my C-section and other birth complications. Giving birth to our first child nearly ended the life of me. After returning from my postpartum appointment last week, I overheard my fiancé's diabolical plan. Although I did not expect to record it, the timing was opportune. Let me set the stage. As I mentioned, I came home from my postpartum appointment and was given the green light to enjoy intimate time with my fiancé. Excitedly, I went to Victoria's Secret to buy lingerie and matching bras and panties because I was feeling attractive and ready to engage in intimate activities with him. I was recording myself and the Victoria's Secret bags when I overheard him. I thought it was even more perfect that he was already at home, and I had these surprises ready to show him. I continued recording, but instead of what I had anticipated, I heard and recorded something that broke my heart. I am relieved that our baby is unaware of the situation because I'm not sure how I would explain it. My fiancé of 10 years was cheating on me, planned to take money from me through child support, and intended for his parents to take care of our baby. Furthermore, he was planning to claim ownership of the condo and cars. I am sick. I am devastated. I am distraught. I am heartbroken. I stopped recording and quietly went to our bedroom with our baby and cried. I woke up to my baby crying and I felt like a zombie. I was so numb and my thoughts were all jumbled. The Victoria's Secret bags were still in the hallway. He lay next to me asleep and snoring while I mustered the courage to send the recording to his parents. His parents bombarded him with messages on his phone in the morning and he reacted by getting angry at me. He called me names, slammed doors, and punched walls. Unfortunately for him, he forgot that we have cameras in the house, so everything was recorded. He claimed that his parents are cutting him off, and he blamed me for the situation. He said I had embarrassed him and ruined his life. He also insisted that I had no right to record him. He warned me that I would regret it and he would take everything I had. In response, I told him to give it a try. I have already consulted with a lawyer, and in our state, common law marriage is not recognized. The person with whom the child resides does not pay child support. Since everything is in my name, he will have to move out. I gave him until the end of the month to move out. His parents and brother have been reaching out to me, expressing their support and apologies. However, my side of the family is still unaware of the situation. He has made numerous calls and left voicemails, texts, emails, and letters ever since I changed the locks and garage door code. He wants to work things out and go to therapy, but I have no desire to talk to him or work on the relationship. I simply want him to leave. I dedicated a decade of my life to this man, giving him everything. While I am not perfect, I have never done anything like what he did. I just want to move on. Additionally, to clarify my situation as a stay-at-home mom and my hiatus from work, it was originally planned for me to be on a six-month hiatus postpartum. However, due to my medical issues, my ex-fiancé and I agreed that it would be best for me to be a stay-at-home mom for the first year of our baby's life. This decision was spontaneous. I received medical advice to avoid physical activity and labor for 16 weeks, so it was not possible for me to work during that time. Therefore, consider me a stay-at-home mom for the first year, plus the six-month hiatus. I am now able to return to work since receiving medical clearance. However, my agency does not allow employees on maternity leave to work unless they have medical clearance from a doctor. I am a mobile registered medical diagnostic sonographer, 
which is why some people may be wondering how a 25-year-old can afford a condo and two cars. I earn a higher rate than an in-house registered medical diagnostic sonographer because I travel and work for an agency. I have the flexibility to choose my assignments for the day or week. Both cars are used, but mine is already paid off, worth $15,000, and I have owned it since I was 18. The other car is worth $18,000, and I only need to pay $3,600 since I put half of the amount down and have a low interest loan. I have been working and saving money since I was 15. I am wise with my finances, as the cost of living here is high. One last thing before I take a break. Many of you are in need of help. Some of you messaged me, suggesting that I probably did something to deserve it or that I probably cheated and that's why he's behaving this way. Others have stated that it is my fault he cheated because I did not provide him with enough intimacy. I went through a near-death experience while giving birth to our son. I shared my story because I needed to release it. I wanted to see if anyone out there has experienced something similar or something awful and how they dealt with it. This entire ordeal has taken a toll on me mentally and emotionally, and I have had dark thoughts. However, I am grateful for the support system I have. I acknowledge that posting my story has its drawbacks, but many of you have been unkind. Now, for a few comments before the update. Comment one, the only thing you need to do is ignore him, set it on mute, and forward anything and everything to your attorney. He's not worth it. He's only begging to go to therapy because he realized that he doesn't have the funds to live the way he used to when he was with you. He probably doesn't make enough to impress his side piece. Comment two, block him. And if he wants to see his child, he can take you to court as he is a clear flight risk as he wants money. Plus with his anger outbursts, I wouldn't allow it until a court orders it. And even then I'd request supervised visits by a mediator. Now for the update, I'm back with an update on my life and the absolute mess that is still my ex-fiance. It's been a little over a month since he last tried to pull his nonsense on me, and honestly, it feels like a weight has been lifted. After I changed the locks and updated the garage code, he finally moved out. I think he realized that he couldn't get back in unless he was invited, and that wasn't going to happen. His parents have been such a constant positive in my life since all of this has gone down. They check in on me frequently, making sure I'm okay and offering their continued support. Honestly, at this point, I feel like they've adopted me as their own child, and I'm not complaining. A little while back, they invited me to join them for a family dinner to discuss everything that had happened. And I accepted because I really did appreciate their support. The dinner took place at this cute Italian restaurant downtown the kind of place where you could just sit for hours eating breadsticks and drinking wine. I was really looking forward to it, considering how tense my life had been lately. His mom brought up how disappointed they were in their son's actions, saying that it was totally out of character for him. That was a nice way of putting it, since she basically said her son is a loser. They expressed their desire to make sure that I felt comfortable and safe. And honestly, I just felt so grateful to have them in my life. I told them about my plans to return to work soon and how I was just waiting for my doctor to clear me. I missed my job and wanted some normalcy, and I also couldn't keep living off the savings I had before this whole mess started. His dad asked what I wanted to do with the condo that I had, and I told them I was considering renting it out instead of selling it right away. I wanted to have some sort of income coming in just in case I needed it. Then the conversation shifted to their concern about my fiance's behavior. They seemed really worried about how he might react to my decisions regarding the condo and, well, everything. They offered to help with anything I needed during the transition, which made me feel so relieved. The next day, I got this message from my fiance demanding that I give him the keys to my car. Like, excuse me? I ignored his request and focused on preparing for my return to work. He had no right to my things, especially since they were in my name. After that, I started receiving these strange messages on social media from accounts I didn't even recognize. I had a strong suspicion they were from his friends trying to intimidate me, 
so I reported the accounts and blocked them. I just wanted to avoid any further harassment. A week after that, I found out from one of my coworkers that my fiance had been spotted with someone new. Apparently, he was at the mall with this person, just living his best life. The kicker? His new partner was someone I knew from the past. Like, not personally, but she was a mutual friend of ours back in high school. I had no idea what the connection was there, but she was not the best person to associate yourself with. I got a call from my parents who wanted to visit for the weekend. They arrived on Saturday, bringing groceries and just wanting to support me in any way they could. My mom made this huge dinner and we sat down to eat and discuss my situation in detail. My dad suggested that I take legal steps to protect my assets and I agreed. I told him I had already consulted a lawyer and was in the process of getting everything sorted out. The next day, I decided I needed to confront my fiance about his new relationship. I wasn't going to let him think he could just do whatever he wanted while making my life miserable. So I texted him and asked to meet at a nearby coffee shop, which was probably a mistake. He showed up looking completely disheveled and defensive, like he hadn't showered in days. I asked him straight up about his new partner, and he tried to deflect, saying it was just a casual thing. I pulled out my phone and showed him the social media posts, and he couldn't deny it. He admitted to seeing someone, but I was done at that moment. I told him I was done and wouldn't tolerate his behavior anymore. He reacted with anger, raising his voice in public, and I could feel the eyes of the other customers on us. That was the last straw for me. I didn't want any more drama in my life, and I was done with him. Mini update. After the confrontation, my ex-fiancé continued to make a nuisance of himself. His parents helped me file for a temporary restraining order, which was granted due to his harassment. I returned to work a few weeks ago and feel like I'm finally getting my life back on track. Am I the idiot for telling my fiancé to keep my ex-wife's desperate email private? Am I the idiot for refusing to share my ex-wife's desperate email with my fiancé? Am I the idiot for telling my fiancé not to share my ex-wife's desperate email online? My ex-wife, 34 years old, sent an email to me, 34 years old, pleading with me not to marry my fiancé, 27 years old. My fiancé wants to share the letter on her social media to expose my ex-wife, but I feel she should be the bigger person and ignore her. My ex-wife Lily and I started dating in college and were together for almost 10 years, married for four. I thought we had a perfect relationship. However, around six years ago, Lily sat me down and told me she was feeling unhappy with our marriage and felt like she missed out on a lot of fun things in life because we got married early and spent all our effort on our career and finances. We are both lawyers and spent a lot of time on our law school, bar exam, etc., and got really high paying jobs. She felt that she never got to live an independent life and find herself. I was heartbroken as I did not know a life without her. We went through a lot of stress during our marriage and could see her side. We split amicably and got a divorce soon because we did not have any assets or kids to worry about. Everything went okay for the first few months. However, Lily started getting panic attacks and went into depression after she started living alone. I still cared about her and helped her during that time. She was also diagnosed with borderline personality disorder and has been in therapy since. We stayed friends as the transition was difficult for both of us. However, I tried to move on from her by going on dates. Lily and I stayed good friends for almost one year after our divorce. She asked me a few times if we should try to work on our marriage, but I had moved on and told her we are better off as friends than as a couple. I met Mila at our running club and we really hit it off. Mila was much younger than me, but really matched my energy, and we started dating seriously soon after. Mila expressed that she found it uncomfortable that Lily was still such a big part of my life. I also felt I wanted to invest all my energy in a relationship with Mila, and I told Lily that I would be distancing myself from her. Lily reluctantly agreed, and we stopped texting each other daily, and only met on social occasions such as weddings or parties, as we both share the same group of friends. Lily and Mila never got along, but Mila tolerated Lily for me. 
Mila and I have been dating for three years and I proposed to her during summer holidays last year when we visited her parents' house. We have been busy planning our wedding and plan to get married in September. Everything was going really well until last week. I received an email from Lily last week pleading with me not to marry Mila. It was a long email talking about how we are soulmates and meant to be together. It was extremely delusional and talked about how I was just punishing her by being in a relationship with Mila and she has learned her lesson and I should take her back now. It talked about how I would be abandoning her after I promised her that I would take care of her in sickness and health for her entire life and my new marriage vows will be meaningless since I promised all those things to her. I immediately told Mila about this and told her that Lily has crossed the line and I would not only block her everywhere, but make sure I go no contact with her. Mila was very upset too and started cursing out Lily on how she is planning to ruin her special day. Mila told me that she wants a screenshot of the email and sent it to my parents. They, of course, supported Mila and told her that Lily has to be cut off forever from our lives, and I agreed. Now for an update. Mila wants to share the email on her Instagram and Facebook so that all our friends would also see Lily's behavior, so that they all block her as well and never invite her to any events. This is where I do not agree with Mila. I know that Lily is not mentally well and has not been depressed again since we announced our engagement. Lily has tried to reach out to me through my friends, but I had not given her a chance to speak to me alone. I feel bad for Lily, and I feel Mila sharing the post would only extend the drama. I also worry that my friends know about Lily's mental condition, and it would feel petty to hurt her while I am moving on and marrying an amazing person in Mila. I have told Mila about all this, and she feels that I am still trying to protect Lily when she tried to hurt Mila by sending that email. I am not sure what to do at this point. Am I the AH to ask Mila to not share the email on social media for everyone to see Lily's private email to me? Is Mila right that Lily deserves all the hurt she would get after she makes the email public? Now for a few comments before the update. Comment one, soft emotional shit show with Lily being the worst. You knew Lily still had feelings for you when she asked multiple times to get back together, but you kept being friends with her. In my experience, this hardly ever works out for precisely this reason. Yes, people can be friends with their exes, but she expressed romantic interest with you multiple times, even after being told no, and then was reluctant when you wanted to lessen contact. Red flags. I am not surprised she kept holding a candle for you and tried to break you up like this. Mila is lashing out now, having been vindicated. She knew there was an issue between you and Lily. Lily has proven that and now wants to go scorched earth. It is enough now that you've gone no contact and told your family. She does not need to put it on social media, and it would honestly be going too far to do so. But you should have gone no contact a long time ago, even with a soft spot for her. Comment two. If she publishes the letter, your ex will look desperate and sympathetic, and your fiance will look cruel. Frankly, she is a bit cruel for wanting to do this, so you definitely need to save her from herself. NTA. By the way, you should not have given Mila a copy of the letter. You should have deleted it and blocked your ex. You should have told your fiance about the letter, but also told her it was gone as part of the blocking process. Giving it to her was the mistake that set all this in motion. Now for the update. One week after Lily sent that insane email, Mila and I went to this engagement party for some friends. The vibe was supposed to be all fun and games, but man, the air was thick with the tension between Mila and me. Like, we were both there physically, but emotionally, we were just totally off in different worlds. During the party, Mila got this text from a random number. You could see her curiosity peaked as she opened it. I mean, who wouldn't be curious? But the moment she saw the text with the screenshot of Lily's email, her face just went full on red. Someone in our friend group had shared the email and Mila was furious. She thought someone had totally betrayed her trust by sharing our private stuff. I tried to ask Mila who sent the text, but she didn't know. And honestly, she was too upset to even talk about it. So there we were, 
Two sad souls at a party meant for celebration, just keeping to ourselves and avoiding everyone else. We spent the rest of the night in silence, trying not to make eye contact with our friends or get sucked into any of the fun. The next day, I couldn't hold it in anymore. I confronted this mutual friend who was also at the party about the email leak. I was like, dude, what's going on? Why did you share that? The friend admitted that they had heard about the email and thought it was cool to share it around, like it was just harmless gossip or something. I was so shocked that I didn't even know what to say. Mila found out that this friend was involved and she was super angry. She demanded that I cut ties with them, no questions asked. I was feeling super cornered at that point and I just told Mila that I needed some time to think about our relationship. We both agreed to put a pause on all the wedding planning stuff and just stop everything going on between us. A few days later, my sister hit me up out of the blue. She was concerned about me and everything happening with Lily. She invited me over for dinner to talk it all out, offering her support and advice. I mean, I could really use some sisterly wisdom at that point. During dinner, my sister told me that Lily had been reaching out to other friends, spilling her guts about how she felt about me. She even asked my sister if she could come to the wedding, saying she needed closure. I felt this huge knot in my stomach at the thought of Lily being at our wedding. It would just complicate everything even more. After dinner, I got this text from Mila, and she was like, do you still have feelings for Lily? I was like, Mila, come on. I'm committed to you. I'm just stuck here trying to protect you while dealing with Lily's drama. Then Mila suggested we meet with this mutual friend who could help mediate the whole mess. I was hesitant, but decided to go along with it, hoping it would sort things out for both of us. The mediation meeting took place at this local coffee shop, and you could just feel the tension in the air. Mila laid out her side passionately, explaining why she felt totally betrayed and hurt by the whole mess. I tried to explain my perspective, but honestly, I felt like I was just a shadow in the corner while Mila took center stage. Our mutual friend was trying to facilitate a productive conversation, but it quickly turned into a shouting match. Mila accused me of still having feelings for Lily, and I was like, no way, man. As we left the coffee shop, Mila told me she needed some space to think about everything. So I went home that night, feeling this heavy weight of uncertainty on my shoulders. The unresolved stuff between us was just hanging there like a dark cloud. Later that night, I got this surprising message from Lily, asking to meet in person. I thought long and hard about whether to meet up with her. I knew it could complicate things even more with Mila, but I felt this obligation to confront Lily directly. So I agreed to meet her. We met up at this quiet diner, and right off the bat, I could tell something was off with Lily. She looked nervous and kind of frail. She apologized for all the chaos she had caused, but insisted that we were meant to be together. I was done playing games at this point, so I told her straight up that I was committed to Mila and had no intention of going back to her. Then Lily told me she had been seeing a therapist and was actually working on her issues. She was hoping for some understanding from me. Edit. I asked Lily why she felt the need to interfere with my life now, and she said she was scared of losing me for good. We talked more about her therapy, and she shared that her therapist believed her behavior was a misguided attempt to regain control over her life. I advised her to focus on her healing journey. Am I the idiot for refusing to adopt my sister's kids even though she named me as their guardian? Am I the idiot for refusing to adopt my sister's kids even after my family tried to guilt me into it? Am I the idiot for refusing to take in my sister's kids after she committed suicide? My sister Sasha, 35 years old, and I are not close. On top of having very different interests, I really don't like kids, and she's the type of person who can't comprehend other people not wanting kids. Our rift widened even further when I questioned her decision to have kids and refused to be an involved Funkle, Fun Uncle, or ATM. She kept trying to force her kids onto me, so I went low contact. Unfortunately, Sasha proved me right. She really struggled and ended up committing unalive two years ago. Worse yet, both of her kids, Amy, 13 years old, and Tim, 11 years old, found her body and an unalived note 
in which she admitted to regretting having children. The baby daddies were not and should not ever be considered for guardianship. My mom, 62 years old, took in the kids and put them in therapy. She recently received a terminal cancer diagnosis and no one is willing to take in the kids. I was named as the preferred guardian in Sasha's will. No, I don't know what Sasha was thinking. And now many are looking to me to step up. Despite a hefty amount of backlash, I refused. I know myself well enough to confidently say that I would be hurtful as a parent. Furthermore, blood isn't important to me, and my relationship with Sasha and or her kids isn't strong enough for me to have an obligation to the kids. And most importantly, I simply don't want to. About two months ago, my mother became desperate. She started feeding the kids stories about how apparently Sasha and I were best friends forever, and how I really wanted to adopt them, but feared rejection, and how we would all be a happy family if only my fears could be resolved. She was apparently planning to have the kids surprise me with adoption papers during the upcoming family reunion to coerce me into adopting them. I refused to play her game. I made up an excuse to skip the reunion and have been avoiding my mother. What I failed to anticipate was my mother using a luncheon with my aunt as a setup. Fortunately for me, I was able to see my mother and the kids approaching from a distance. We were sitting outside at a cafe and got the heck out of there before they could trap me. Now for an update. The kids have regressed into a downward spiral. Many are blaming me, saying that I made the kids feel unwanted that I should have just said yes, and even the more sympathetic ones think that I could have handled it better. I am being hounded by my relatives, but I don't see how I'm responsible. Yes, my borderline running away during the luncheon with an oh sh look on my face probably helped the kids connect the dots, but it was never my responsibility to cover for my mother's lies. She set the kids up for heartbreak, knowing very well that I already rejected them and would never have agreed to be their guardian. So tell me, am I the jerk? Now for a few comments before the update. Comment one, why don't any of the family members hounding you take them in? Not the idiot, it's your life and you're under no obligation to take in someone else's kids when you've already said you don't think you'd be a good fit. The kids need to be somewhere they're cherished and taken care of after such a tumultuous life. What your mother is doing is cruel to everyone involved, desperation or not. She needs to find another family member. Good luck. Comment two, not the idiot. You made it super clear up front. You would not be a suitable home for the kids who will have a shoot load of problems needing therapy. Your mother trying to bait and switch is terrible and you need to speak to her directly. The rest, F your family crying from the rooftops, tell them to adopt the kids. Now for the update, Two weeks after the whole ambush fiasco with my mom and the kids, she called me out of nowhere about Sasha's kids. I nearly freaked out when I saw her name pop up on my phone. Turns out, the kid's grandma ended up in the hospital because her health was still getting worse. My mom told me the kids were struggling emotionally and insisted that I had to visit them. I felt totally overwhelmed just thinking about seeing the kids again, especially after doing my best to avoid them but I reluctantly agreed to drop by their house to check on them. When I got there, I was hit with a wave of nostalgia. The place was filled with toys and drawings of their mom were everywhere. It was both adorable and heartbreaking. Amy and Tim were there, but they were super distant and wouldn't even look me in the eye. It was uncomfortable as hell. My mom insisted on sticking close to me the whole time, trying to steer the conversation towards the adoption topic. She kept mentioning how the kids were asking about their future and if their uncle would take them in. I was just trying to change the topic by awkwardly talking about school and hobbies. While I was there, I noticed an old family photo on the wall and Sasha was in it. That really made me uneasy. Then Tim asked me straight up why I didn't want to take them in. It was super awkward and the silence was deafening. I tried to deflect the question, but it just hung in the air. A week later, I went to a family dinner where the topic of Sasha's kids came up again. It was like a never ending nightmare at this point. Relatives started discussing possible guardianship options and things escalated quickly. 
One of my cousins had the nerve to suggest that I should step up or risk losing the kids to foster care. That set off a heated argument between my mom and my cousin about what was best for the kids. I just sat there in silence as everyone turned their anger towards me. I felt so cornered. I eventually excused myself, saying I needed some fresh air to escape the chaos inside. While I was outside, I overheard my mom telling relatives that I was immature and irresponsible. Those words cut deep. I had flashbacks of my childhood with Sasha, all the conflicts, and it just made me feel like crap. The following week, the children's grandma passed away, leaving the kids without a guardian. The news hit the family hard. Relatives started pushing me to reconsider my stance again. At the funeral, I could feel everyone's eyes on me, whispering about the kids' future. Amy and Tim were obviously upset and I tried to console them, but I felt so lost. After the funeral, my mom confronted me about my lack of action regarding the kids. She claimed that I was their only hope and that I owed it to Sasha to care for them. I mean, seriously? She was the one who set this all up. Tension hit an all-time high during a family gathering where the kids were brought up again. My mom, in front of everyone, announced that the kids would live with me after the holidays. I left the gathering early, realizing that the pressure was building for me to make a decision. In the following days, I got bombarded with calls about the adoption process from relatives. I spent the next few weeks avoiding calls and messages, preferring silence over all this conflict. Edit. I eventually decided to discuss the kids' adoption with them. They were surprised, but seemed relieved. They just want stability and a chance to move forward. I'm helping them adjust. If you like this video, you'll probably like these too. Also, while you're here, please consider subscribing. It's your support that keeps this channel alive and allows me to make better and longer videos. Have a great day.